Let's stick to the English language for this whole session to make sure that everybody's able to participate. Uh, I'm broadcasting from Austin, Texas. My name is Marco Hansen. I'm a um, mostly a Spanish translator and interpreter, and I work for Texan Translation. It's a family business, but I also uh, teach once in a while at UT and ACC in the legal interpretation and uh, legal translation areas. And I'm so excited to get together with um, colleagues from across the state, each of whom has a unique program. And I'm with so many people who are interested in studying translation and interpretation, some of the related fields. And so I put together a, a short presentation on sort of the big picture, uh, what this industry or career or profession is about, and some of the terms that might come up in the presentations by each of the instructors. So I will first uh, share my screen. Um, and then later on, I'll be talking specifically about the UT program. So give me a thumbs up if you can see my orange and red PowerPoint. Thank you. And I don't know how to do this. Okay, first of all, a little backstory why I'm here. Here's a picture of my family and me in Saudi Arabia years ago. My four kids, my camel, my wife wearing uh, an abaya, the traditional black robe. And there in the background is our Toyota. Um, I was living in the Middle East teaching English. I got stopped for speeding. Apparently there were speed limits way out there in the desert that I didn't know about. I was given a ticket in Arabic. I thought I knew Arabic at the time. It turned out I couldn't understand a single word on the ticket and I didn't know what to do with it. I had to go downtown and talk to the police who didn't know English. Um, my Arabic turned out to be inadequate for dealing with uh, legal set settings. And I came away with a real profound respect for the fear and panic that you feel when you're dealing with a foreign language and foreign legal system in a foreign country. And so when we came back from that job abroad, I got into uh, legal translation and court interpreting, not in Arabic, my Arabic is still rusty, but in Spanish. And so I feel real motivated to help people because I, I know what it feels like to be stuck in the US court system when your English is okay for everyday purposes, but it's not really good enough for that high level, um, high stakes kind of communication. Personally, I leapfrogged from one language related job to another starting in 1999. I was a telephonic interpreter for Spanish and then I taught in bilingual ed at the elementary school level and I taught Spanish as a first language and a second language in high school and college and did freelance translation and in-house translation for different government agencies. And now I work mostly in project management for companies that are trying to connect with uh, limited English proficient uh, people here in the United States. Um, I set up this event today because I see an urgent need for more and better language access in the United States and especially in Texas. We have millions of people in Texas who are limited English proficient, who have um, spotty ability to connect with the legal system and the medical system and social services. And so I think that there is a lot of room for developing the skills of our bilingual people so that they can serve um, their friends and neighbors who are um, have lower English levels. So some terms that you'll probably hear today and in your program are translation, which technically means uh, working with written language. Some people say I'm a translator when they're actually working with the spoken language, but we try to teach our students that's called interpretation. If it's a spoken or a sign language. We also have something called localization. And that involves translation plus, and it usually it has more cultural adaptation. Like I play video games. One of my favorite video games is made in Poland. The original language is Polish. I know no Polish. And so I play the localized American version of that video game where all of the voices have been translated to English. The text has been translated to English and certain cultural um, allusions for the Polish players have been recast into terms that uh, an American English speaker will more readily understand. So localization brings together translation and other technical and artistic pursuits. Um, you should also understand what a source language and a target language means. Source language is a language it's coming from, target language is a language it's going into, and the a, a little carrot symbol will often show which direction that the translation or interpretation is going. Um, that's also called language pair. Like I'm a Spanish into English translator. 
And so my language pair is Spanish and English. My direction is Spanish into English. But when I'm interpreting, I go back and forth between English and Spanish. So interpreters talk about their language pair, but in general, they don't have a language unless they are a conference interpreter. It's a very special kind of thing. If you just joined the call, would you please make sure that your audio is muted? Let me try to. Sorry, mute. I'm I'm trying to mute her, but it's not working. Him, him or her, her. Um, Yvonne on the iPhone. We're trying to mute you, but we're hearing audio from your mic. If you could work on that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Um, you should also know the acronym LEP, Limited English Proficient. This is somebody who probably speaks English fine for certain social situations, but when it comes to complicated conversations like talking to the doctor or the judge. Their English uh, isn't uh, advanced enough, isn't fluent enough. And then uh, you should be aware of the difference between a certificate and certified. A certificate means you finished a course of study and you have a diploma or certificate that says you have X number of hours of study in this field. Um, and that's good. And it will help you get jobs and help you get work. But it's not the same as being certified. And to be a certified translator or certified interpreter means that some organization or some government entity has tested you on your skills and you reach a certain minimum level. And so you are certified to um, act in certain settings. Like you can be a certified medical interpreter. You can be a certified court interpreter or in Texas, a licensed court interpreter. And so um, it's good to keep those straight on your resume and on job applications because um, sometimes they'll be asking for one and the other and they do mean different things. Generally, um, a certificate is um, uh, midway through your, through your studies or through your career progression. And then eventually a lot of people have the goal of becoming certified and the certified is a higher credential. So the job outlook in Texas, this is a, a diagram I got from a friend at the state bar who helps lawyers um, talk to LEP clients in Texas. And this just represents all the different requests she got last year for attorneys um, helping in different languages. And so you can see that Spanish is the largest, but Arabic is close, followed by Vietnamese and Haitian Creole. And there are lots of other languages in demand. So worldwide, the industry was estimated last year at $43 billion in revenue. Um, translation, interpretation, and localization is big business. There are hundreds of thousands of people who do this around the world. In the US, the median uh, annual wage was about 52 thousand dollars last year and that's when you're halfway through your career um, employment is expected to grow 24 percent over the next 10 years or in, in this decade which is much faster than the average for all occupations so a lot of jobs um, are being replaced by computers and robots and their employment stats are going down um, our job is, is impacted by technology especially translation there's software that really changes the way we work but um, regardless, the call for human experts who can do it is still growing much faster than average. So it's a good growth industry to get into. Um, but I would mention that it, this is a part of the gig economy, meaning most translators and interpreters um, work gig to gig. They're freelancers or they're contracted. There, there's a significant number that work time for a company, um, but uh, a lot of us are still either part-time translators and interpreters while we do other things like teach um, or we go from gig to gig. And so that does affect the uh, job security and the benefits that you will be looking at when you go out to find work. So out of all the different language related jobs, you might be wondering which one's right for you. And I have a pet theory and you, you guys are free. My colleagues who come on are free to dispute this. But I feel like in my experience, most translators are more introverted. They like sitting alone in front of a keyboard and researching stuff and getting just the right word. While a lot of interpreters are more extroverted, they tend to also be musicians or performers. They like to get out and talk to people. They like to interact face to face. That's not, that's not always true. Uh, localizers, uh, a lot of them are more technical. They like working with uh, computers and software. Subtitlers are the people who put the uh, foreign language uh, version of what's being spoken on the bottom of the Netflix screen or the movie. 
uh, transcribers or people who listen to audio recordings and then type it in the language that they hear and then often will translate it into a foreign language for legal purposes or business purposes. A lot of uh, language specialists also work in tutoring, teaching and instructing, helping people to learn the language that they know or as voice talents. And this would be somebody who does the voiceovers in a different language for videos and advertising and entertainment. And there are many other related jobs that you can use your language skills in. And so think, uh, think big picture. Let's say you, you speak Korean, you live in the United States and you wanna use Korean in your job. You can go to any of the job search engines and just type in Korean and see what comes up. And you might be surprised at all the different ways that language is in demand. So again, super generalized. There are four groups of students that I usually see in my classes. Often, if they're in the U.S. as a first-generation immigrant, they were educated in, a, in another language. Um, please keep your mic on mute if you're just joining us. They were educated abroad in another language, and they are very fluent in reading and writing that language. And when they start the training, they have to focus on getting their English language skills up to a high level of proficiency. If they're second generation in the US, then probably um, their, their heritage language skills, they learned at home in a social setting. And so they're very conversational, but they don't have the high level of academic proficiency in that heritage language. And so their studies focus on making sure that they can converse about a variety of topics and that their vocabulary is very large in their heritage language. While if they are third generation US or later like me, I'm a third generation uh, US citizen, um, my grandfathers are both from Norway. Um, often they've lost their heritage language completely. I can only say a few words in Norwegian. And so I started from scratch. I just went with the new language. I grew up in a Mexican American neighborhood where everyone spoke Spanish. And so I got into the Spanish English niche. And so I have to not only develop my second language skills in Spanish, but I have to also make sure that I can, um, that my English is good, that I uh, read and write really well. <clears throat> And then we have unicorns who are these magical people that go back and forth between cultures. One parent spoke one language, the other parent the other language, and they grew up half and half in each country. And they're completely um, biliterate, bicultural, and bilingual. And then their, their challenge just becomes learning the skills of converting between the languages quickly and accurately. So what's next for you? Um, whichever language is weaker or weaker if you speak multiple languages, work on developing those um, to a higher level. Use your other language in whatever your current job is. Look for volunteer opportunities to develop your skills at converting quickly and accurately between the languages in your head. Um, study and practice on your own. Find a buddy who's doing the same thing that can help keep you accountable and practice with you and just keep you company as you study. Look for freelance opportunities, starting out with easy, low paying jobs and then working your way up to more complex and higher paying gigs and be open to trying new things because each of us are, are on a journey in our language skills and everyone's journey looks different. So I'm going to stop sharing. I've gone over my time just barely, but that's fine. We're gonna be flexible today. And the uh, next presenter, I'm happy to introduce my friend and colleague, Esther Diaz from ACC. Esther, take it away. Thank you very much, Marco. I appreciate that uh, intro. So I'm going to share my screen with you to, uh, to walk you through this presentation that I have um, uh, about the translation and interpreting program at Austin Community College. And um, just a, a very quick background on myself. I'm one of those unicorns. <laughs> I grew up uh, part of the time in Mexico and part of the time here in the US. And I, I was educated in both languages. So um, I feel very comfortable in Spanish and English. And I, uh, I, was, um, I initiated the uh, translation and interpreting program at Austin Community College 23 years ago in collaboration with the Austin Area Translators and Interpreters Association. And in the beginning, we were very, um, uh, very much connected to them and still remain, but not as much as we were in the beginning. So I have recruited instructors and students through the Austin Area Translators and Interpreters Association. And um, uh, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought there. 
And uh, now I'm also involved with the Texas Association for Healthcare Interpreters and Translators and also recruit instructors and students through that organization. And I am a certified translator, uh, certified by the American Translators Association for Spanish to English and English to Spanish translation. And I'm also certified by the um, Certification Commission for Healthcare Interpreters, CCHI, uh, uh, for Spanish healthcare interpreting. So with that, let me go on to the next slide. So as Marco mentioned, there's a difference between translators and interpreters. Translators work with written text, interpreters work with spoken or sign language. And um, uh, the program has courses, the program at Austin Community College has courses for both translators and interpreters. We work in the language pairs of Spanish to English and English to Spanish. So each course has a component in which you work from Spanish to English and also from English to Spanish. Here's a program overview. This is a uh, continuing education program of Austin Community College. It is non-credit and uh, it is considered a fast track career. And ACC has been promoting fast track careers uh, during the pandemic. And so we have gotten a lot of interest during the pandemic and we offer our courses online. So that's, that's worked out well for us. So here is the overview. We offer um, in each academic term, we offer one level. So we have a track for court interpreting, a track for community and medical interpreting and a track for written translation. So the very first course that students would take is an introduction to translation and interpreting. That really is an overview course that teaches them about the profession, the kind of information that Marco just shared with us. In addition, we have um, practice of very easy um, uh, translation and very easy interpreting so that people can determine whether they are better suited to one or the other, and whether their language skills in their own opinion are up to speed for what is needed here. Uh, we also conduct tours of um, a, a local translation uh, unit at a state government agency, and uh, of a, uh, of a, we, go to we go to juvenile court to observe interpreting there. During the pandemic, these tours have been done virtually. So after that introduction course, that's mandatory, it's a prerequisite, then we um, ask students to take a language assessment. They must be fluent in English and Spanish, and the language assessment will help to demonstrate that. Um, before we had this requirement in place, I did train several people who thought they knew Spanish and they really struggled and just did not do well in the courses because they weren't fluent. So now we, we have that component. So each summer we offer the introduction and the language assessment. And then in the fall, students can choose from the first level of court interpreting or community interpreting or basic written translation. And then in the spring, they choose the second level of court interpreting, medical interpreting, or advanced translation. These, uh, these can be taken at the same time because they're offered on different days of the week. If a student has enough time and money, <laughs> he or she can take all three tracks, but typically students just concentrate on one track and finish that. So what is required for admission? A college degree is not required to register for this program, but it is recommended. Because it is a non-credit program, you don't have to go through the admission process at all. You simply sign up for the courses you want to take, but you must be fluent in English and Spanish, written and spoken. So as Marco was describing, the people who um, are second generation immigrants best probably know their home language well spoken, but they haven't learned to read and write it. So that's, that's a difficulty. 
Um, fluency, as I mentioned, is determined by passing a language assessment in English and Spanish before entering the tracks. Most of the students that, that I have had over these years have been immigrants. In other words, they were educated somewhere else and then they came to the US and they have been in the US long enough to learn English well, to be educated in English. So what are the prerequisites? And the first course in the series is an overview of the profession and it's a prerequisite for the rest of the courses. Then the language assessment is also a, re a prerequisite that's available after the introduction course. And many people um, contact me and say, I wanna get started, where do I take the test? Well, the test comes after the introduction. So I have found that by giving people information about the profession, they can self-select whether they think they're ready or not. Instead of having them take a language assessment first and being turned off to the profession by you know, not passing this test. If they, if they had the introduction first, they understand what it takes, then they don't pass the, the assessment, then they understand what they need to do to get up to speed. No one is exempt from the assessment, that is, as it is essential that students be fluent in English and Spanish. And this is the best way to prove it. Many times uh, students contact me and say, you know, I grew up speaking Spanish and I wanna learn more. Can I take your courses? No, first you have to learn more <laughs> and then you take these courses. So course delivery. The courses are currently offered online. They were delivered uh, in classrooms before COVID, and um, we, we had to quickly readjust to offer them online, and uh, the other instructors and I were very reluctant to teach some of these subjects online, but we have found a way to, to do that, and it works pretty well. So Austin Community College is now offering us the opportunity to offer them online or in person. So for this uh, coming session, the summer session, they will be offered online. And they are offered one weekday evening um, for each course from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. So this schedule allows people who are working uh, uh, to, uh, or to have commitments during the day to take these during the evening. And uh, 5.30 to 8.30 is three hours. And that seems excessively long for an online course. However, we have practice and we go into breakout rooms and students do not have any problem whatsoever with the three hours. Each course is 10 weeks long. So it's one night a week for 10 weeks. The entire series takes three semesters to complete and students can take as few as three courses just for one track or as many as seven, which is the whole program. The cost. Registration for each course is $296 plus nominal fees. And currently there's a, there's a discount going on, a 50% discount through August of this year. Tuition is the same whether you live in Austin or not. And textbooks, because these are online continuing ed courses, textbooks cost approximately $75 each for only the medical interpreting course, court interpreting and basic translation courses. The other courses in the series do not require textbooks. The instructors um, uh, generously provide materials that they have created or that they have found in other places. So what's in it for me? <laughs> Students receive a certificate of training after each course but this is not considered professional certification as Marco was explaining. These courses will help students begin to prepare for state and national exams for licensing and certification. And uh, lastly, I'll leave you here with my contact information. And I understand that Marco is going to make this uh, presentation available to you online. So you will have my contact information. Okay, Marco, are we, we're taking questions at the end, is that correct? Yes, we'll do questions after all of the instructors have spoken. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, um, next we'll be hearing from Veronica, Veronica Demichelis at Houston Community College. All right, thank you. 
Let me share my screen. I hope you can see it. Um, so I'm here representing uh, the translation and interpretation program at Houston Community College. A little bit about myself. I am a freelance translator and localization professional. I am ATA certified from English to Russian, um, and I'm the lead instructor in uh, the translation interpretation program at HCC. I also co-host a podcast for translators called Smart Habits for Translators, and I am an active uh, volunteer in American Translators Association. I am uh, president-elect. My term as president will start next year in October, and I chair ATA's professional Professional development program, um, develop, develop professional development committee. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, okay, so here's a brief overview of the translation and interpretation program at HCC. It was established in 2015. Um, and uh, we consider it to be the most comprehensive credit hour training program for translators and interpreters in Texas, um, approved by THECV and SACS. Um, it is a credit hour program, not continuing education, um, and it's fully language neutral. So we work with students in all languages. Um, classes are taught online and in a hybrid format, uh, meaning that some courses are taught half online and half on campus. Um, and we teach at Spring Branch, Spring Branch Campus in Houston and in Katy. Um, our program is um, being developed and maintained in close collaboration and dialogue with various stakeholders, meaning potential employers, translation agencies, hospital networks, um, state and federal government agencies, professional associations, and various um, resource centers and networks for translators and interpreters. Um, and we have developed our quality metrics and the rubrics for grading um, in various courses based on uh, the ISO standards for translators, translation and interpretation. Uh, we also have a program advisory board um, um, where we have representatives of various stakeholders um, who help us define the strategy for the program, um, how we're going to grow it and maintain it, and the quality metrics for our courses. So our stakeholders are uh, deeply involved in, um, in our program life and our students and graduates um, success. Um, we have um, the following types of awards at the moment. We have a certificate level two that I'll talk about in more detail later on. Um, it's a three semester um, certificate, 42 credit hours. And we have an associate in applied science, um, which is a four semester um, degree in, um, and 60 credit hours. Uh, we are currently working on launching a uh, certificate in localization and audiovisual translation and hoping to launch it in the fall. Um, and the difference between the um, AAS and certificate level two in our program is um, we have a course on localization and audiovisual translation in the associate um, award, and uh, it also um, uh, in includes 15 credit hours core curriculum mandatory courses that are required by the state of Texas. Um, and as Marco and Esther <laughs> already said, uh, the certificate uh, is different from certification. So certificate level two in our program is a formal college level education in uh, the field of translation and interpreting. Our students, um, as I mentioned, we work with any languages. So we've had students um, working in Spanish, Arabic, Ukrainian, Kazakh, Russian, French, Korean, Chinese, uh, Urdu, Hindi, Norwegian, Portuguese, and many others. And we also have experience teaching students who are blind or visually impaired in our program. Our students are typically uh, re-entering the workforce, um, uh, professionals in other fields who want to diversify their skills or restart their career, um, interpreters or translators who want to get professional training, or uh, students that are taking other classes at HCC in parallel and have um, the necessary language skills and they join our program. We've had more than 50 graduates since um, our program launched in 2015, and um, all of our graduates are successfully working. Um, so here's an overview of our certificate level two program. Um, in the first semester um, in the fall, uh, we have the composition one, the learning framework, um, the fundamentals of the theory and practice of translation and interpretation. This is where you learn the basics, the theory, uh, and um, how to deal with various translation and interpretation challenges. Um, then we have writing, editing, and revising for translation and intercultural communication, specifically applying to translation and interpretation. And then in the second semester, we teach medical terminology, 
technology for translation interpretation that includes various translation tools um, uh, that help automate and make your translation work more uh, efficient and productive. Legal terminology, uh, we teach terminology management and research, and then we have two specialized written translation courses, one in science and technology and one in legal. And in the third semester, we have the introduction to legal interpreting, um, an advanced project in translation. Um, then we have a specialized written translation course on medical um, and two interpreting courses, one on medical and one on simultaneous translation. And then we finish it off with our capstone course, um, which is the inter internship. And I'll talk about that in more detail later on. Um, and then our um, associate degree um, is a four uh, semester um, degree. We have um, the same kind of start, um, including also general linguistics in the first semester, um, study technology, terminology, legal, sci tech and all that. And then, as I mentioned, in the last semester, we have that uh, course um, the um, sorry, in the third semester, we have the course on localization and audiovisual translation. Um, so our internship is a capstone course. It's uh, 144 hours um, of um, internship opportunities for students. It consists of several modules. So our students have the chance to actually practice the skills that they have been taught in the program um, in a real working environment. So we find internship opportunities for them in different places. Um, they have um, chance to practice subtitling in, and interpretation at HCC TV, uh, translation interpretation at Christ Clinic, um, um, interpretation at San Jose Clinic, the shadow interpreters at federal court, um, they uh, create super titles, subtitles, and promotional literature uh, in various languages at Houston Grand Opera. Um, they intern at MasterWord Services on different types of assignments, including interpreting for MD Anderson, immigration services, and so on. And as I mentioned, we as, as we work with various stakeholders, we always are on the lookout for new internship opportunities for our students. In the past, we've also had them help localize and transcreate um, different types of um, materials in different languages. So there's always some interesting opportunities there. And our contacts are on this page, uh, Dr. Natalia Nolan, who couldn't be here, unfortunately. She's a program coordinator and founder, so she could be reached um, by email. And then I included links to the tuition calculator um, on the HCC website and the page with our program overview. Thank you very much, Veronica. Um, by the way, those of you who are just joining us, if you have questions for a specific instructor at the end, we'll have breakout rooms where you can select which one you want to go talk to, and then you can change and talk to somebody in a different room and ask them um, how, how you might uh, get into their program. So it's next uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ray Romero from University of Houston downtown. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? <clears throat> Okay, so I am the coordinator for the interpreter training program at UHD. This is a non-college credit course, um, courses. There's two of them. Here you can see a picture of our webpage. And uh, basically, uh, these are the, the hours that are required for students to take either the court interpreting exam in the state of Texas or the medical interpreting exams by NBCMI or CCHI depending on which one you choose. So these are only the required training hours that are, that are uh, required by these associations. Uh, I don't teach these courses. Uh, I do coordinate them. I, I prepare everything. You know, I, I take care of the um, uh, attendance, materials, all that. The instructor is Graciela Sosaya. I don't know if you guys know her. I don't think she's in this picture. Oh, uh, we need to fix that. But, um, you know, we have classes only on Saturdays, <clears throat> usually from 8.30 to 4.30. And these are only Saturday classes. And you can see the requirements. Uh, let me see. Basically, just, you know, be an adult, 18 years and older, high school diploma equivalent. And you have to be proficient between English and any other language. So it, it's either, you know, we have students that speak Vietnamese, Chinese, French, Creole, etc. And... Um, Usually we need a minimum of seven students. We haven't canceled any classes yet. Usually we have the, the right amount. Um, and again, just like everyone else has emphasized, these are not certification or certificate for all courses. Hmm? <clears throat> uh, these are not uh, certifications or certificate program courses. These are just the required hours 
the required hours that you need in order to sign up to take these exams. And so that is the non-credit uh, program. Um, they're always, they're never online. I mean, we try to do hybrid during the, the pandemic and we tried before, but we feel that, you know, now that things are open up again, uh, we're doing everything face-to-face -face again. And they're usually done on the one main uh, street campus, which is located uh, right in downtown uh, Houston. And the price usually uh, it's around five hundred dollars. Um, what else can I say? We have an upcoming training starting April twenty three. Right now, we are already in the middle of another training, and you know, it's a pretty decent size of classes, about fifteen students. And yeah, so this is the non credit program. Again, I can send you this web page if, if you have any other questions. Everything is in detail. And now I would like to talk about the credit program. Let me see if I can share this other. Let me see. Let me try to share the other. So this is an example of our minor. We have a minor in translation and also a minor in interpreting. Our minor in translation has three different tracks, medical, legal, and general. And I and I'm the one who teaches most of these courses. Um, basically, uh, our, our minor in translation is designed to work only from English into Spanish. I feel that this is unique for our program and this is unique in the United States because most programs focus from X language into English and that only tends to favor the English speaking population. I wanted to make it so that it favors the Spanish speaking population, especially given that Houston is about 40% Hispanic and so is Texas. So our program will only work from English into Spanish and it focuses very heavy on making sure that your Spanish translation is, is the best that it can be. Uh, we incorporate courses from different disciplines, um, you know, Spanish communication, English, and also depending on, on the subject area, you know, we can include anything from Anthropology, biology, sociology, technical communication, philosophy, et cetera, psychology. And so this program right now, uh, it can only be done if you are already a UHD student. So you need to be accepted to the university and be part of a BA program in order to have a minor. However, you can also take it as a post -bac. So you can also request admission as a post -bac and you can be part of the program and have a lot of students we take it like that. We are in the middle of expanding this program into a major. Uh, it's going to be a BA in translation only. Uh, we're not focusing on interpreting right now. So we're only gonna be working into um, BA in translation. And um, let's see what else can I say. Just like the other program at HCC, we also have a internship. It's 120 hours. And usually we have um, agreements with several organizations. Uh, I'm glad that when I saw the list in ACC that we're, we're dealing with different organizations. So that's good. Um, a lot of my students end up working at the Law Center, the University of Houston. Uh, they help with pro bono cases, also different clinics and different um, uh, health uh, facilities in the, in, the, in the city. And I'm not sure what else I can say. Um, I guess I can tell you a little bit about my qualifications. Um, I have a PhD in linguistics, I have a master's in public health, I have a certificate in analytic linguistics, which is what sometimes people call FBI linguist. I'm ATA certified, I have a certificate in community interpreting, I'm actually a trainer for community interpreters, and I also have a certificate in criminal proceedings interpretation and medical interpretation from the Southern California School of Interpretation, and I think that's about it. If you have any questions, uh, please you know, feel free to uh, reach out. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Marco, for organizing this. Thank you very much, Ray. That's great. All right, next we're going to learn a little bit about the University of Texas Arlington from Dr. Monica de la Fuente. Thank you, Marco. I'll share my screen. That is right. You can see my screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm Monica de la Fuente Iglesias. I uh, grew up in Spain and I came to the US to complete my PhD in Hispanic linguistics. 
I, uh, I work as a freelance, freelance translator and I am an assistant professor of Spanish and translation and interpreting now at the University of Texas at Arlington. I am also a certified legal translation, uh, translator and interpreter uh, in Spain. And today I'll be talking about the program in Spanish translation and interpreting uh, here at UT Arlington. Um, at UTA, we offer a BA in Spanish translation and interpreting, uh, which consists of 120 credits, uh, which is usually completed in four years. And this was the first BA in translation and interpreting in the north of Texas, and it was established in 2006. We also offer uh, two certificates uh, in Spanish translation and Spanish interpreting. And each certificate consists of 15 credits. Um, and the time of completion varies depending on the requirements that students uh, have completed before enrolling. So for instance, uh, transfers who have taken the CLEP exam, which stands for College Level Examination Program, they might be able to complete this both certificates in three semesters. And in order to obtain the certificates, students need to pass an exit exam. As uh, was explained in the other programs, this is not a professional certificate. So this is the first step for students to begin to prepare uh, to take the national or state certifications. Our program is oriented towards community translation and interpreting. That is the kind of language that uh, uh, service that enables communication between monolingual Spanish speakers and public services or administration. Um, our curriculum includes medical, business, technical, scientific, legal, and human services translation and interpreting. Uh, both of our translation and interpreting classes are bidirectional, so we work from English into Spanish as well as from Spanish into English. And all our classes are taught in person here in Arlington. Uh, we're housing, uh, or the program is housed in the Department of Modern Languages. And the classes are typically taught in the mornings. Once the students complete uh, the language requirements and some other general core courses, they start uh, to take our translation and interpreting classes. We offer uh, an introduction to translation, an introduction to interpreting. And these classes cover the theory, methods, techniques, and practice of uh, translation and interpreting in several fields, such as education, business, health, advertising, uh, journalism, social services, etc. And after the introductory uh, classes, they take our specialized classes in both uh, legal um, translation and interpreting and uh, medical translation and interpreting. Um, our classes are offered in a rotation, as you can see here in the PowerPoint. So uh, the introductory uh, classes are offered, uh, so introduction to translation is offered in the fall, and then the specialized classes are offered in the spring, and the opposite happens with interpreting. The introductory class is offered in the spring, and then the specialized classes are offered in the fall. And just a quick note that our introduction to interpreting class and our inter inter interpreting in medical and healthcare settings, it can count toward the minimum 40 hour medical interpreting training that is required to be certified as a medical interpreter. Uh, other relevant classes that our students can take besides our uh, main six translation and interpreting classes include, for example, uh, multimedia translation, transcreation, and software localization, which uh, focuses on topics such as dubbing, subtitling, transcreation, uh, video game, and, uh, and software localization. We also offer Spanish for Health and Human Services, uh, which focuses on uh, vocabulary building and understanding the Hispanic Latino uh, culture in the field of healthcare and social services. Uh, we have a class for Spanish for the professions, which also focuses on vocabulary building in uh, other fields like law enforcement, uh, education, business, communications, uh, this uh, Spanish language study is a requirement for our BA, and it's an overview of the Spanish language and its structure, and it includes a linguistic approach to translation. We also have a minor in uh, localization and translation, 
in several languages such as Spanish, Arabic, Chinese, Korean, French, German, and Russian. So students uh, in all these different languages take uh, several classes and obtain a minor in localization and translation. We offer Spanish in the United States for those interested in the uh, historical, cultural, and social issues related to the use of Spanish in the US uh, and explore topics such as code switching or Spanglish. We have a class on business Spanish. Uh, and then students uh, can also take several courses on Hispanic uh, culture and literature. We specifically recommend our translation and interpreter students to take uh, Latin American culture and civilization. But there are many other uh, courses that they can take depending on their, on their interests. Uh, everything we do in uh, UT Arlington is guided by the university's strategic plan is both solutions and global impact. So our program uh, prepares students with the essential skills uh, for success in the job market. And for that purpose, we offer paid and unpaid internships, uh, translation companies and nonprofit organizations where students uh, provide translation and interpreting services at the same time that they receive academic credit. Uh, we provide close mentorship uh, with uh, or in collaboration with our community partners. And once a year, we have a modern languages career day uh, where students have the opportunity to receive advice and network with employers uh, from a variety of organizations and industries. As translators and interpreters, we are committed to bridge the gap uh, between languages and cultures in the Latino community. And our program uh, provides immersive learning opportunities for students. So 100% of our students have the opportunity to uh, engage in service learning. Uh, currently, three of our courses, Introduction to Translation, Introduction to Interpreting, and uh, Interpreting in the Medical uh, Healthcare Settings, they can um, go uh, collaborate with nonprofit organizations and receive academic credit uh, for the class. Students can also uh, obtain extra credit for volunteering. And here there's some of our community partners in the DFW area in a variety of fields from schools, free clinics and hospitals, legal organizations, uh, human rights organizations, and translation and interpreting companies, etc. We have a summer study abroad program in Cuernavaca, Mexico. And uh, we also offer support to our students, uh, free writing support and free conversational practice, uh, both at Spanish Writing Center and La Mesa Española, which I have uh, meetings and events weekly. Graduates from our program uh, have worked or, uh, or are currently working uh, as translators and interpreters in a variety of, of settings, uh, in hospitals, in several companies, in educational settings, several ISDs, in the government, in some government institutions. You can please mute yourself in translation agencies, and uh, many are uh, work as a professional freelancers, and some are also master licensed court interpreters. So lots of different, as, as Marco mentioned at the beginning, uh, lots of different industries require translation or interpretation. So in addition to your love to, of language, you can work in a field that interests you. Um, so we have many, many options. And I will quickly go over some funding opportunities that we provide to our students. Our department uh, supports student success with merit-based scholarships. We award two twenty thousand uh, dollars of scholarships every year, and students can also apply for scholarships through the Charles McDowell Center for Global Studies, which usually awards uh, fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars of scholarships every year. Um, this is the, I, I will post, uh, the, put the, uh, our webpage on the, in the chat, uh, but this is our webpage, and you can also uh, contact our program director, Dr. Alicia Rueda Cedo, uh, at this email address. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica. 
it's so exciting for me to see how this field is growing around the state and, and so much more is available than it was when I first got into it 20 <laughs> some years ago. So thank you for sharing. Uh, next, I, I'll be speaking about UT Austin, but first I wanted to mention that on behalf of uh, Victoria Garcia, who teaches at UT El Paso and wasn't able to be here, um, I'd like to uh, mention the um, programs that are offered there. And this is just from the webpage for this event. UT El Paso has a minor in translation and interpreting studies, which is Spanish to English and English to Spanish. And that's a six course program that's in person over four semesters, as well as a bilingual professional writing certificate, Spanish and English, which is a four course program taught over three or four semesters and it's designed to prepare students who will be writing in a variety of um, positions in both English and Spanish. So the links are there on our website, textandtranslation.com slash education, if you'd like to get more information. Now switching over to UT Austin. Uh, I'd like to uh, preface this by saying that this program is currently on hold. The program manager um, uh, was replaced and they're shuffling around some of the admin positions. And so there is no scheduled section available right now, but if you go to the website, you can sign up for updates. And when one gets back on the calendar, you'll be notified. So UT Austin, this is a non-credit continuing ed program um, for people who often are already working in education or in some field, um, the legal field or are looking to change careers. It lasts 40 hours, um, taught over the course of uh, 10 weeks, and it's synchronous online currently, but before the pandemic and after the pandemic, God willing, it'll be back in person as well. Uh, legal interpreters, um, also known as court interpreters, um, it's almost the same thing. Uh, their job is to remove the language barrier as much as possible for limited English proficient people to access the justice system. We have to render a complete and accurate interpretation with no emission, summarization, explanation, or opinion. We are considered neutral and unbiased officers of the court, and we have to protect confidential information. So legal interpreting is a lot like medical interpreting, but some of the rules and practices are, are specific to the legal field. We have to have educated native-like mastery of both English and another language, and we have to have a wide uh, general knowledge that's typically characteristic of at least two years of college education in practice. Most legal interpreters have bachelor's degrees, some graduate degrees. And we have to be able to demonstrate that we can interpret three different ways. Sight translation is where you look at a page in English, for example, and read it aloud as if it were in Spanish. Consecutive interpreting is where two people are talking in two different languages and you're going back and forth interpreting in both directions in the pauses. And then simultaneous interpreting is when you're listening, usually over headphones to speech in one language and continually interpreting without pauses into the other language. And so our program includes training in each of these three modes. And if you get your credential to work in the Texas courts or the federal courts, you'll also have to demonstrate those three modes. Court interpreters work in Texas in 456 district courts, 505 county courts and 2,323 justice and municipal courts, so it's a big market. And we also work at law firms for depositions and attorney-client meetings. And then if you are a legal interpreter, you end up doing other non-legal work like interpreting at conferences and medical and educational settings, nonprofit. And some of us work from home, either interpreting um, telephonically or um, over video conferencing. And of course, a lot more of that during the pandemic. So in Texas, there are currently 486 licensed court interpreters. And there are lots of other people who aren't licensed court interpreters who work in legal settings, like within a law firm where no credentials required. Um, these are the languages that are that Texas license holders currently have. If you, if you don't see your language here, that doesn't mean that you can't uh, interpret in a Texas legal setting. It just means that you'll be the first one and you'll be the go-to for that language. So how much demand is there? The last census said that there were this many limited English proficient people for each of these languages. This is the order um, of uh, precedence. Um, uh, Spanish is the main one, of course, followed by Vietnamese, Chinese, Korean, and Arabic. And those are the number of people who, 
whose level of English is probably um, not high enough that they would be able to interact with a judge and an attorney uh, in a legal setting without the assistance of an interpreter. So could court interpreting be your career? Yes, but keep in mind that most of us are self-employed contractors. Uh, Spanish demand is high and can be a full-time job. With other languages, a lot of interpreters for non-Spanish in Texas um, will either interpret over a large area nationwide or worldwide remotely, or else they will do both court interpreting plus other things like teaching or translation. So I surveyed all of the Texas licensed court interpreters a couple of years ago and asked, what's the job market like? Are you getting enough work? And um, about 80% of them said, yes, I have plenty of work. Um, only 15% uh, of them said I'm actively seeking more assignments. I asked, how much are you charging when you work for a private client like a law firm? And the, the most common response was between 81 and $100 an hour. So $100 an hour to do any job I feel like is very lucrative if you can keep your calendar packed with assignments. And then if you're working for a court, um, courts and government um, and agencies pay less because they can offer more work, but that average was still between $61 and $80 an hour. So to become a licensed court interpreter in Texas, and this UT program is preparing you to take these exams, you have to pass a written exam, which is all English, just to show that your English is proficient. And then if you pass that, you take an oral exam, in which is language specific English and whatever other language you're working in, covering site interpretation, consecutive interpretation, and site, site translation, I should say, and simultaneous interpretation. So only currently about 20% of people taking, um, trying to become court interpreters in Texas are able to pass. It's a very rigorous exam. A lot of people go in overestimating their own readiness. They say, I'm bilingual, I'm sure I'll do fine. I'll just take it and see what happens. And it turns out to be harder than they expected. They haven't done enough specific targeted study and preparation. They don't have real world mentoring from an association like the ones listed here. They don't have peer support, people who are helping um, them study and give them time and space to study and um, study buddies, or they just have so much test anxiety that when they get there in the room with the tester, uh, they freak out and aren't able to do their best work. So at the UT program, uh, we teach uh, uh, fundamental theoretical concepts like um, ethics for court interpreters, and then we do a lot of practice using uh, simulated uh, content or real content from a court setting in the three modes of interpreting so that people can uh, build up their accuracy and their speed. Those are the two things. Even if you know all the material, you have to be accurate and fast in order to keep up with uh, real life spoken language as an interpreter. We also visit a courthouse when they're open so that you can experience firsthand details like where you stand and who's who in the courtroom and um, what will be expected of you in different kinds of hearings. So this is a 40 hour course um, taught over 10 weeks. And the focus is um, developing the skills to act as legal interpreters and prepare to take the licensing exams in Texas, which is the same exam that's shared by something like 44 states. It's produced by a national nonprofit. And so if you take this course in Texas, you can test in another state and you'll be equally prepared there. And um, here's an example of some of the topics that we study, uh, different types of legal settings and activities. Um, the, the legal system is complex and some interpreters end up working almost entirely in immigration or almost entirely in criminal court or almost entirely at uh, personal injury depositions. And so you'll probably find yourself specializing based on what you um, are most interested and skilled at. The cost is uh, 1345 if you sign up far enough in advance, depending on when the program is starting the date, or $1,495. Um, the regular price, there is a payment plan. And that is a quick rush through the UT program. So um, if you'd like to know more, I invite you to come to the UT breakout room, uh, where either me or Holly Beal, who's another one of our instructor, we can give you more details. So next, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nazaret Fresno, who teaches at UT RGV in my hometown of Brownsville, Texas. Thank you, Marco. Just let me share my screen with all of you so that you can see my presentation as well. 
Okay, so uh, there we go. Can you see that? Perfect. So, well, first of all, let me just begin by thanking you, Marco, for putting together this event. And I'm seeing that we do have a very rich higher education in Texas when it comes to translation and interpreting, and that's very positive, I think. So uh, let me talk to you a little bit of what we do at UTRGV. Now, we are a university located in Brownsville, in, in also in Edinburgh, so um, two different locations. And we have some transition interpreting programs uh, back there. I didn't think about introducing myself, so I'm sorry about that. I didn't uh, prepare a slide about myself, but I can just tell you that I'm an associate professor there. I was born in Spain, bilingual family. So I speak Catalan and Spanish. I spoke Catalan to my father in Spanish to my mom. So I grew up as many people here in Texas in a bilingual household. And so I moved to the States, I think it was six years ago, seven years ago. And uh, I've been ever since working at UTRGV in the treasure and debiting programs. So um, let me give you a quick overview because we do have an undergraduate program and we do have some graduate programs as well. Uh, when it comes to the undergraduate program and also for the graduate program, so um, I should first clarify that we work uh, with the English Spanish language pair. And so we train our students to translate and interpret from English into Spanish and also from Spanish into English. Now, when it comes to our undergraduate programs, we do have a translation and interpreting minor, which can be completed in three semesters usually. And we also have a BA, which uh, has 120 credits, so the usual BA length, and it's usually completed in four years. And these undergraduate programs are face-to-face. -face. So we will have our students and the instructor physically in the same room and uh, you know, doing the typical things that you do in a physical environment. So these are um, what we call face-to-face, -face, traditional classes, if you will. Now, when it comes to our undergraduate programs, uh, we have different kinds of them. Um, all of them are 100% online, which is important to mention at the beginning. And this basically means that you don't need to be physically located with your instructor, right? And uh, also we use a mode that we call online asynchronous. Um, and what this means is that we don't ask our students to log in a specific day or time. And this is basically because we have students, you know, in different states here in the United States, but also in different countries in the world. So if I remember correctly, I think we now have someone in Argentina, in Jamaica, in Guyana, so different places with different time zones. And so that makes it difficult for us to be able to join all of us in the same room at the same time, even if it's a, you know, an online room. So we will usually work with this uh, weekly deadlines. We will give you a plan for the whole week. And the idea is that every student participates at their own pace and also whenever it's more convenient to each of them, right? So some of our students work in the mornings, some of them work in their academic work at nights, some of them work in the weekends. And so this kind of flexible method gives us the, the chance to you know, uh, be able to train students in different situations in different places of the world as well. Now, within our graduate programs, we do have five graduate certificates. And uh, again, as my colleagues have mentioned before, these are academic certificates. So these are not professional certifications, but these programs would be the first step, right? So um, you would receive the academic training in order to be able to then uh, go for a professional certification. So we have five different certificates. These are short programs, five course um, uh, programs. And the style here would be that our students would take uh, some introductory courses to translation and interpreting. Those would be common for all the certificates. And then depending on the area, depending on the area that each student is interested in, then they would take a different set of elective courses. Now we do have a Spanish translation and interpreting certificate which um, usually we have students here who are not willing to pursue a career in translation and interpreting. But this is, uh, I would say, recommended for a profile that, um, you know, we have, for instance, lots of Spanish teachers or lots of social workers as well. So these are people that are not translators and interpreters per se, but they need to translate and interpret quite often for their work. And so they need to be able to do this at the proficient level. And so that's basically uh, the profile that we have here in this certificate. 
Uh, we also have a literary translation certificate, which is aimed at those students that are willing to translate literary works, right? So if you're passionate about translating Cervantes or Shakespeare, or maybe comic books, well, this is the program for you then. We do have a health interpreting certificate, and this is very interesting to students who um, either want to translate medical documents. So think about, for instance, the CDC website, that would be something along these lines. And also this is interesting for students who want to facilitate communication between an English speaking doctor, for instance, and a Spanish speaking patient or the nurses and the family. You know, so those kinds of settings would be the ones that uh, we would be looking at in this program. We have a court interpreting certificate, which is basically aimed at people interested in the law. So if you're like Marco and you like translating legal documents or you like to, you know, interpret in trials, hearings and those kinds of settings, this would be a good choice. And then my personal favorite, which is the localization and audiovisual transition certificate. Uh, well, and this is not my favorite, just to be clear, because it's the best one, right? So all of them are good. But this is just um, my personal favorite because I was trained in audiovisual translation. So that's actually my area of specialty. Uh, so uh, that's one that I uh, really, uh, you know, has a close place in my heart. Now, uh, these are our graduate certificates, short programs, five courses each. But then we also have a longer program, which is the master's program. This is 12 courses. So this takes usually about two years, between two and three years, depending on the number of courses that each student takes, because that's flexible as well. And I'm very happy to tell you that this master's program was, uh, was ranked best in the US a couple of years ago by Online School Report. So this is an independent organization that we didn't pay for this or anything. They conducted like an, an independent study on transition interpreting programs at the MA level. And they looked at the, uh, affordability and quality and several criteria and so um, I'm proud because our program was ranked the best one. And so um, that's uh, what I would say in terms of graduate programs. And um, my colleagues here have been talking a little bit about why transition and interpreting is important today. And they've shared the stories, right? So Mark was telling us about the problems in Saviour Audia, uh, in Saviour Audia with Oh, I'm so sorry about that. So uh, he was telling us about that um, camel and the problems that he had with the traffic agents, right? So uh, in my experience, transition and interpreting has been a little bit different. And I wanted to tell you my story through an image. So this is actually a frame from a film, a Spanish film that's called El Espíritu de la Colmena. And uh, so this tells the story of a Spanish village back in the 1940s uh, after the Civil War. This is a poor village, right? So they've never seen the cinema before. And they somehow managed to get a copy of the film Frankenstein. And so this is a big event and they organize a screening and all the village just goes to see the film. Everyone, right? So the old people, young people, even they take kids to see Frankenstein. I'm not sure if that's the best option, but you know, they have everyone there. And this little girl here is called Anna. And this is her reaction when she first sees that moving images on screen. So she's mesmerized. She's kind of so immersed, she loves it. And there's this film scholar whose name is uh, Ed Ten. And he says that cinema is an, uh, an emotional eliciting machine. And I think he's very right. But in order to be that um, emotional eliciting machine, you need your audience to understand the dialogues in the film. So think about a Japanese film. It may be a masterpiece, right? But if I'm not, if I'm not able to understand what the characters are saying, then I won't be able to appreciate that film. And that's what translation gets uh, its important role. Audiovisual translators are the ones who actually allow us to understand films that uh, we could not understand in the original language. And so in my view, that's part of the magic or that's one of the magics, if you will, about translation, that the translators really help, in this case, viewers, but also readers, if you will, enjoying and making sense of uh, masterpieces that we would otherwise um, would not be able to uh, enjoy. 
And that's basically what I wanted to tell you about our programs. Muchas gracias, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Nazareth. And last but certainly not least is Melissa, Dr. Melissa Wallace from UTSA, who's also sort of a co-host. She set up the Zoom call and I really appreciate your help. Melissa, take it away. I can't hear you. Oh, that's another difficulty remembering to unmute myself, but I was saying that um, I'm having, when I try to, share my screen. I apologize. I'm not seeing the tabs. They'll say unknown, unknown. Um, so let me try to go a different direction. That's not Marco, share weird. your slides. Sorry, Marco, share your slides. Uh, that's a great idea. Marco, can sure. I send it to you really quickly? Yeah, and maybe you I, already did. I, I have not, but I'm going to do it right now. And um, that's a really good idea. I, of course, this always happens, right? When <laughs> this always happens when you're on the spot and I hate to have a lull in the conversation because everything is going so well and I'm so enjoying this. So I have found the file and just sent it. Really, Murphy's Law usually strikes much earlier. We got through almost the entire presentation. <laughs> yeah, well, I kind of feel like it's always me too, but <laughs> I, I hope some of you can relate. But in any case, um, <laughs> we're also having a fun little chat in the sidebar here because it turns out that three of the program representatives all speak a minoritized language, which is beautiful and amazing. So um, while, uh, Marco, did you receive the, the email? Uh, not quite. I bet it's a big attachment. If you want to just jump in, I'll open it as soon as it comes. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure. Yeah, I sent it to, yeah, Marco Hansen, text and translation. And so I'll just, it, here it is coming up. Okay. I'll just get started and let you know really quickly that um, I also didn't include an introduction slide, but um, my name is Melissa Wallace and I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas in San Antonio. There's our intro slide right there. Thank you so much. Um, so um, I am the director of our graduate certificate in translation and interpreting studies and a few other smaller programs, which I'll talk about in a minute. I also did my PhD in Spain, like a few others here. So um, in Alicante, and I'm a certified healthcare interpreter, certified court interpreter, and that's enough about me. The first thing that I wanted to say really was thank you to Marco for organizing this because it's a long time coming. It's really interesting that this, this came um, from, from the professional community, from one of our great allies. So it's great to be in touch with all of my colleagues across the state. I'm finding a lot of inspiration in your programs. And also, Marco, thank you just so much for organizing this and for the 31 people who decided to spend their Saturday morning with us. So great. Very quickly, I don't have lists of the elements for each of the programs, but UTSA has three options for those of you who want to pursue translation and interpreting. So the U stands for undergraduate and the G stands for graduate. At the undergraduate level, we have a certificate in healthcare interpreting, and I'm so glad that many of my colleagues have already made very clear that a certificate from a university is, is an academic mini degree. It's not the same as certification, which is from the professional world. So we have a certificate in healthcare interpreting. We have a minor in translation and interpreting studies. And then we have a graduate certificate in translation and interpreting studies. So if you want any more information about any of these, um, I did put some links in the chat, but I also included my email and I'd be delighted to go into detail or talk about them more in the breakout room in a minute. Okay, so more important things to know about our programs is that they are credit bearing programs. So you do have to go through the typical college admissions process. If you wanna do one of the undergraduate programs, then you have to apply to the university. And if you wanna do the graduate certificate, you have to already hold a degree from a four-year institution. 
So because it's a because it's a university, everything works on their schedule, and that includes admission deadlines. Um, and I sent you a link in the chat. You have until June fifteenth if you're interested in doing our graduate certificate. And at the moment, our classes are not fully online. So in fact, before the pandemic, they were not at all online. They were all face to face. During the pandemic, they were all online, either synchronous or asynchronous. Then we had a period of time where they were a little hybridy, <laughs> sort of some in person and some online. In the fall, in theory, we're going back to all in person. But at the same time, there's kind of a strong, there's kind of a strong sentiment among students that they really like online options and they want more online options. And um, that would open up possibilities for us to expand our program. So all of this is just to say, please keep in touch. If you live somewhere outside of San Antonio and you're interested in attending, please, please, please just um, shoot me an email at any time and I'll let you know sort of how the winds are blowing. For the moment, we're gonna go back uh, full-time in person in the fall. So our classes are not fully online, but they are at night. So when they're face-to-face -face or when they're synchronous, they run for just shy of three hours from six to eight forty-five, one night a week. And we work with only one language pair at the moment, which is um, Spanish, English, English, Spanish. So, so why UTSA? I just wanted to tell you a few things about our, our institution. Kind of an exciting thing that happened to UTSA is that it was just designated an R1, which is a research one university which basically is a designation that's giving to, given to, thank you, I see the clapping hands. I mean, it actually happened much sooner than I was expecting. <laughs> so some of my colleagues here already work at R1s, but um, it means that we have higher funding and research output. And in theory, this bodes well for our programs. In theory, that means that we're going to have more funding for, for research, for developing curricula, for hiring professors. So this, this bodes well for the future. We're also an HSI, which is a Hispanic serving institution. Um, I believe several of yours are as well. And there are actually only about 20 universities in the, in the United States that have both of these designations. So UTSA is really, I think, becoming recognized for the urban Hispanic serving sort of university that, that it is. So it's really great to be receiving that, that, um, that recognition. In terms of our program, especially our, our main graduate certificate, it's a little bit of a salad bar right now. So it doesn't allow for specialization at the moment. I'm hoping that we can grow. So we, we have classes in translation and interpreting, and all of these classes incorporate uh, basic elements of some, some theory of translation studies, some history, uh, usually lots of practice and a good dose of introduction to professional realities. But at the same time, even though we offer sort of a complement of traditional classes in translation theory and healthcare interpreting and interpreting in legal settings, we also have once in a while sort of specialty courses that are a lot of fun. So I just wrote down, for example, one class that's being offered this semester is um, translation of eco-poetry. So we have students who are hands-on working on literary translations of poetry um, in an anthology from Spanish into English, and this volume is going to be published. So it's, it's a really fantastic experience for our students. Then in the fall, we're going to have a class that's kind of inspired by the book, Translation Goes to the Movies. And even though it doesn't have an audiovisual focus on it because of my lack of expertise, unless one of my colleagues wants to uh, maybe co-teach it with me, not that it, but um, it is basically a, an exploration of concepts in translation studies, but integrated uh, through, through movies. So that's going to be a lot of fun too. And then a quick word about our graduates. So um, a lot of our graduates have actually done um, an interesting amount of research and have presented their original work at scholar um, at conferences around the country at places like Georgetown and UMass Amherst. We had a couple of students who have been awarded Nagit as Nagit scholars. So they're recognized by our largest 
professional association for legal and judiciary interpreters and translators in the United States, and they were able to attend the conference thanks to NAGIT. Uh, we had one student who attended the NIDA Institute, which is a very prestigious kind of summer school for translation studies that takes place in Italy every year. We've had students publish book length translations. And all in all, we're seeing our students are leveraging their skills in translation and interpreting in a lot of fields. So we have people who are working directly in translation and interpreting, for example, in the FBI as certified healthcare interpreters, um, Defense Language Institute. Uh, but we also have, uh, like one of my colleagues mentioned before, a lot of people who are interested in in sort of documenting skills that they already have by having a piece of paper that shows that they do have the underpinnings and they do have sort of an academic background as well in translation and interpreting. So our students go out to work in all kinds of fields and leverage the skills that they learn with us. My final comments are just a reminder to check out the chat because um, people from all of our programs have been sending you contact information and good links along the way. If you have any general questions, you can always forget, I mean, remember <laughs> to um, reach out to me at any time. And then finally, I guess my, you know, one piece of advice that I give students all the time is to try to try to have everything going for you, right? Getting valuable work experience gives you credibility and pursuing certification in the professional well realm gives you credibility, but also deepening your knowledge by having an academic degree is, is also extremely important. It makes you a very attractive candidate. I'll also mention, like some of my colleagues have, that becoming affiliated with and being active in a professional association is invaluable. So with that, I will um, once again thank Marco for saving my bacon and um, turn it over back to him.